Thank you very much, and I'm pleased to be here in Canberra and participating in the Outlook Conference. My remarks cover long-term drivers of global markets and U.S. policies, and I'll make the case that while macroeconomic conditions and have changed and commodity prices have fallen, the overall forces shaping markets in the world and the U.S. remain largely the same. I'm going to review some of these trends and then turn to recent developments in U.S. farm policy in the 2014 Farm Bill and conclude by looking forward. Um, USDA's annual baseline provides a framework to assess drivers of global markets. On February 19th, we released the market projections for 10 years out to 2025. And they are based on specific assumptions about macroeconomic conditions, policy, weather, and international developments with no domestic or external shocks assumed to occur to global markets. In terms of policies, the baseline assumes that current policies continue throughout the period, including the 2014 Farm Bill. And as such, this is one scenario that's based on a combination of our models and some expert judgment. The first chart here shows the macroeconomic projections for gross domestic product, or GDP. And the global growth throughout the period averages 3.1%, which is slightly below the long-term trend prior to the 2008 financial crisis. You, there's two lines here. On top in green is developing countries. On the bottom, developed countries. And we see we project higher rates of growth in developing countries. This combined with higher rates of population growth reinforce a shift towards developing countries as the drivers of ag markets and trade. Two other significant drivers of agricultural markets are oil prices and exchange rates. On the left, you see crude oil prices, which are assumed to increase from recent lows at rates that are higher than the general rate of inflation. On the right is the awaited U.S. agricultural exchange rate, and you can see the recent appreciation of the dollar, which we assume will continue into 2017 and then begin a slow, gradual depreciation through the end of the projection period. This is the average, but we, the baseline assumes different rates of appreciation vis-a-vis -vis countries around the world. One of the smaller ones is for China, given the Chinese management of their foreign exchange rates. The largest real appreciation of the dollar takes place against Russia and other former Soviet Union countries. On average, on balance in the exchange rate, the dollar appreciation um, reduces U.S. exports. We've seen that already, and this is especially true for basic commodities and intermediate products, less so for processed products. Um, in terms of other pol important policies, renewable energy policies remain a significant driver of markets. Within the U.S. in the projection period, ethanol continues to account for about a third of total U.S. corn use. Um, this drops slightly due to um, the ability to blend ethanol into gasoline, but nonetheless, it remains important. Globally, biofuels are projected um, production is expected to increase in the next 10 years, although at a slower rate than in the past. Now, that's the macroeconomic background, um, and they lead to a slow recovery in global growth in global demand for agricultural commodities. USDA baseline also assumes rates of technological improvement, and they continue to grow. If you bring this demand and su supply side together, that implies that we see slowly recovering prices, and this is U.S. farm prices for soybeans, wheat, and corn, and here you have a line that shows where the projection period starts. Among the three, soybean prices rise the most, reflecting increased demand for soy products linked to growing meat demand, um, to meet in increased demand in developing countries. Um, you see a similar story on the meat side. 
And on the left-hand side, you see U.S. production of poultry in green, beef in red, and pork in blue. And on all three, we see growth in projection in the U.S., um, partly linked to lower feed prices that make it more competitive. We also assume increased um, technological improvements. And I think the key component is the growth in international demand. I don't include dairy production, but that's also projected to grow. On the right-hand side, you see U.S. per capita demand for these three meats, and they rise ever so slightly. Um, and this is even as the baseline also includes declining nominal prices for meat. In fact, the declining price for beef is slightly more than other meats, which helps arrest the fall in per capita beef consumption. So you, the real action in beef for U.S. producers is in global markets. And this chart shows total um, exports from the major exporting countries. And you can see that that grows over time for all of the different major meat products. What we don't see in this chart is that there are shifts among the exporters. And I, this illustrates a second point that Jamie also made, that an important trend in global markets is increasing competition um, from developing countries that are growing as both importers and exporters. For example, in 2014, India became the world's largest beef exporter, and its exports are projected to increase by 30% over the next decade. Um, I think I've only mentioned China once in terms of its exchange rate, but China remains a powerful force in global agricultural markets. This chart shows soybeans, um, imports in, for around the world, and green shows that China already has become a dominant force in global soybean in, as a global soybean importer, and that's projected to increase. As such, Chinese macroeconomic conditions and policies are going to shape the markets for soybeans and other products. Another example um, of a market that's important to the U.S. is cotton, and China is the world's largest cotton importer and also holds record levels of stocks. My one final chart on the baseline reinforces this point about competitiveness Across, for exporting countries. And here you see global corn exports, where the U.S. remains a large producer and exporter of corn, but in response to higher prices in recent years, you can see the growth in exports from the former Soviet Union in green, Brazil in black, and Argentina in gray. And um, I, th I think this growth in competitors around the world in all products means that the U.S. needs to invest in technology and management strategies in order to manage costs to remain a competitive exporter. I'm going to tie up a few key points of the drivers from the baseline and the U.S. economy before turning to farm policy. And one trend that I've talked about that we've heard also at this conference is the growing importance of developing countries as a source of demand. In blue on this chart, you see the growth in U.S. ag exports that have taken place over the past several years, um, with a decrease last year largely due to the exchange rate changes. And what's interesting here is in green, you have the share of exports going to developing countries, in red to developed countries. And these lines crossed in 2003. And while we see some dip um, in the most recent year, I think the baseline and common and wisdom in the US is that developing countries are going to remain the largest source of growth for um, agricultural markets and for US producers. A second key factor that is behind the baseline, and you can see in recent trends, is that growth in agricultural output depends on productivity and new technologies. On the left-hand side, you can see results for the United States, and this is an index of total output, total inputs, and total factor productivity, which is a ratio of outputs over inputs. 
the um, lines for total factor productivity and total output really lie on top of each other. And you see at the bottom in light blue total inputs, which change little over time. And this goes back to 1950, showing that for decades, the growth in US agricultural output has been driven by changes in technology. Um, in the world, if you look back, and this goes, the chart on the right-hand side goes back to 1960, that wasn't true globally. Changes in inputs um, were driving increases in output on average globally into the 60s. But if you look in the most recent period, we have data for 2000 to 2012, it's total factor productivity that's now on average globally driving the increase in production. And that's the green bar where you see um, in bright orange total input growth, um, gray is irrigation, and light orange is more ag land. So going forward, the role of um, investments in research that lead to new technologies and farmers' um, innovations and management practices will be critical to increase agricultural output. Another um, important dimension that drives US policy decisions is the nature of farms that underlies these supply curves. And in the US, we see two somewhat seemingly contradictory thing, trends at the same time. One is growing size of farms. And here I'm providing a measure that the economic research developed using calling the midpoint acre. Above this um, line, half of production is on acres of farms greater than that size, half below. And in the most recent period year measured 2012, that's 1,200 acres. Um, I think we think that's a better measure than average acreage, which is below, because there are many um, very small farms, and their changes in numbers can distort the measure of the increasing size of operations. And we don't, in our looking at the data on the cost of different sizes of operations, the economics seem to suggest that farms will grow in size. However, at the same time, we see more farms um, engaging in non-traditional activities. And this shows changes between 2007 and 2012 of different focal points, including direct sales to consumers and agritourism. And in all these categories, there's more farmers engaging in these activities. And this reflects a growth in consumer interest in their, where their food comes from and how wanting to have a stronger connection to farming. And both of these trends, the si growth in the size of farms as well as consumer interest in food are shaping farm policy going forward. So let me turn last to um, US ag policy directions. And I'm going to start by looking at the 2014 Farm Act. And for those of you not familiar with US ag policy, this goes in five-year cycles. Um, the most recent Farm Act was um, passed and signed by the president in tw early 2014. And this pie chart re represents an estimate for total spending over the five years that was updated in um, January 2016 by the Congressional Budget Office. And you'll see that the large, you see that the largest share in blue is for USDA's nutrition programs, which provide assistance for low-income Americans in meeting their um, nutrition needs. You, Commodities account for 5% commodity programs, crop insurance 9% of the spending, and conservation 6%. The other 1% category in yellow, this represents um, trade programs, credit, rural development, research and extension, including my agency, which is located here, um, energy and miscellaneous programs. So, with, um, within USDA, the spending is dominated by nutrition programs, and these three farm programs are also an important share of what um, is invested in by Congress. Let me turn now, and I'm going to focus on the um, farm and insurance programs. Um, conservation is important, but I'll leave that aside today. Um, if you then st start, I'll start with the commodity programs. The USDA has a forecast for farm income, and the first forecast was produced in 
February 2016, and it includes estimates of different types of spending for commodity programs. This doesn't include the insurance programs. And the light green color represents prices where payments depend on prices. And while the slide says there's a transition from fixed to price dependent programs, it's really an evolution. And this shares have shifted over time under different farm policy regimes and different market conditions. In 2016, payments that depend on prices are projected at over $10 billion. These payments are um, largely based on some set fixed or program acreage and not um, the production isn't linked to prices in the market at the, in each year. Um, you also see over time growth in conservation programs. And within these programs, there are more payments going to working lands versus land retirement programs. Um, the recent Farm Bill introduced new programs. Um, there are some special programs for cotton that I'm not going to discuss, but three new programs that were introduced for field crops are the price loss coverage, or PLC program, and the agricultural risk coverage, ARC, which has two variants, one based on county yields and one based on individual yields. And this each um, farmer in the US had to decide at the beginning of the Farm Bill what program they would choose and then stay with that program throughout the duration of the Farm Bill. And this shows the choices that farmers made. And it varies by product. You see that um, soybeans, corn, oats chose mainly the ARC County program. Um, rice and peanuts chose mainly the PLC program, and wheat producers split their decisions. And um, analysis by farm extension agents and economists show that, as one might think, the expected payments under each program were the key driving factor for farmers. Um, one thing that is interesting is that less than 1% of farmers chose the individual coverage option. And I think the analysis around this indicates that that's a couple things. One, it was a, it's a more complex program. It may, um, producers may have good close substitute in the crop insurance programs. It also had a lower payout based on 65% of the baser program acres versus 85% in the county average. Um, so I think this is, you know, we have what, were widely called more complex programs, but farmers were able to make decisions and um, choose which program to participate in. Let me turn now to crop insurance. And over time, the growth of crop insurance and has crop insurance has grown and covers more acreage and more farmers. This trend shows millions of acres covered over time starting in 1994 through 2015. In addition to the growth, you see a changing type of crop um, insurance plan. In blue are revenue insurance products based not only on yield but also prices, and you see the growth of these revenue products over time. Another um, trend in crop insurance policies in the US is expanding coverage beyond the major field crops. And in gray are um, insurance policies written to the non-big crops um, of corn, soybeans, and wheat, the other in gray. And we see in the last, um, well, we see over recent times that um, the share of the major crops has fallen by 10%. And this variety of policies doesn't just apply to the type of crop, but also to the way of production, as there's a growing number of crop insurance policies for organic products. And then I have one final point that I make that is a driver of US farm policy, and that's the distribution of payments to different sizes and types of farms. And in the last um, few Farm Bill discussions, there's been concern about whether payments from the government are going too much so, and this is a value judgment, to large farms that may be commercial operations with high incomes. And 
I think this is um, really linked closely to the fact that payments are directed towards production. Crop insurance is linked towards production. If you produce more, you insure more. But at the same time, as we saw earlier, the size of farms are growing on average. So to the extent that the programs remain linked to production, we're going to see, I think, an ongoing concern about more payments going to higher um, levels of production and higher income. And in this chart, you see the share of payments in green and the scale of the farms increases from left to right. So it, it illustrates the more payments going to larger operations. Let me conclude by looking forward at some of the drivers of food and farm policy in the United States. Today I focused on markets and some of the traditional farm policies, and these issues will remain important. You hear them being discussed already on an ongoing basis in Washington. Concerns about whether the um, insurance or revenue protection that creates what's called a safety net is sufficiently effective. Um, there are discussions about competitiveness, the role of the U.S. in international markets. Um, on average, the U.S. exports about 20 percent of its production every year, so these markets are very important. We see um, discussion of competitiveness in technology, of the structure and size and scale of farms, and whether there should be limits on payments. But, and we see conservation policy discussed and being looked at as a way to meet commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But as I alluded to earlier, there's also increasing interest and discussion in the US of consumer concerns about the way farm products are produced. And right now, there's an ongoing debate on the government's role in labeling for genetically engineered or products of biotechnology. So all in all, I think it's a really interesting time to be working in food and ag policy. There's a lot of research issues that um, we're seeing in the US and other countries. And it seems like that's also true in Australia. Thank you very much.